As is usual for this time of year, people have started to complain about Rotten Tomatoes. Their favorite summer blockbusters have come out. Some of them have been trashed by Rotten Tomatoes and people start freaking out. So I look at my Facebook feed, I see occasional comments, Rotten Tomatoes always gets it wrong. And if you've looked at my, like your Facebook feed, if it's like mine, you've heard that there's an actual petition out there to take Rotten Tomatoes down because they're biased against DC movies. Now, if you do any research into this, it's just some person that doesn't understand Rotten Tomatoes, but it got 15,000 signatures, which is a lot for something that fundamentally misunderstands what Rotten Tomatoes is. So here's my basic idea for today. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't suck, but maybe your understanding of Rotten Tomatoes sucks. But Rotten Tomatoes serves its function very well and does exactly what it says it's trying to do. You just might not understand what that is. And for what it is, it's probably the best tool in all of human history for this particular function. But you have to understand what that function is. You have to understand how to use that function. Now, if you don't understand all of that, don't factor that in. You just see a number and you, man, I love this movie and they didn't like it. This is ridiculous. Or I hated this movie and they loved it. This is ridiculous. If you're doing that, you're not thinking critically, you're not using your brain, you're just reacting emotionally to something you disagree with, which is not useful. And I guess you can do that if you want. I would recommend thinking deeper about things and understanding things, so hence this video. So what is Rotten Tomatoes? Well, I'm gonna read to you their description from their website and it says this. The tomato rating based on the published opinions of hundreds of film and television critics, is a trusted measurement of film and TV programming quality for millions of moviegoers. It represents the percentage of professional critic reviewers that are positive for a given film or television show. So in other terms, it's an aggregate of movie reviews or television reviews. They don't have a team of reviewers. They don't have their secret group of reviewers. It's an aggregate. They take a whole bunch of them and they summarize the findings. They have a formula by which they take hundreds of reviewers, not even all from America, not all from English speaking places, hundreds of reviewers from around the world that have a reason that they're on the website. They've earned that by being with a national publication, by growing a following on their YouTube channel. They've earned the right to be a critic um, and through this, they filter through all of them through their formula and come up with a score. In any page where it shows their tomato meter, it'll tell you how many ratings they have for that movie. And for any big Hollywood blockbuster, it's over 150. Any wide-released Hollywood movie, it's over 100. And most smaller releases, it's still over 50. So you're looking at the reviews of a diverse group of people from all over the world reviewing this movie and all kind of crammed into this one score. Now, you might not like that. You might say, critics are bad guys. Critics don't know what they're talking about. Critics are all old men. But you have to step back and go, well, that's not really true anymore. This is not the year 1990. Siskel and Ebert aren't the young guys in reviewing anymore. This is a modern era, and YouTube reviewers are on there. So people like Chris Stuckman, is, who's a YouTube reviewer that is actually good at what I'm doing right now, He's on there. The guys from Schmoes know they are on there. And there's all these other websites that are internet-based. They're fanboys just like me and you that review things, and they're factored into that score. Rotten Tomatoes is keeping up with the times. They understand how the internet works and who is reading their website, so they're allowing YouTube reviewers on there that have earned a following. But you also have to understand what the Rotten Tomatoes score is and is not. The way their scoring works, the way their formula for the aggregate works, is it's all binary based. Or in their case, it's fresh or it's rotten. It's one of these two things. So it doesn't matter how fresh and how great something is, and it doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter if it's the best of the year or the worst of the year. It's given either a fresh or or a rotten, one or the other. And so a reviewer, the Rotten Tomatoes doesn't tell reviewers how to review things. They take the reviews from those people and that person decides whether they go fresh or rotten even based off their own scale. And so that's where you can even go to the pages on Rotten Tomatoes and it'll say some critics gave it a C plus and one person will put that as a rotten and another person will have it as a fresh. That's because those reviewers just kind of answered that question, is it fresh or rotten differently? And so when you think about it that way, it, it, 
it has a very different interpretation of how you're understanding their formula because this isn't summarizing, uh, factoring how good, how bad. It's just rotten or fresh. Yes, you should go see it. No, you can wait. Don't go see it. It's one or the other for all reviews. And so you have to interpret it through that lens to understand what the score is. And so for something to be certified fresh, it has to have 60% of reviewers on their site giving it a fresh rating. Doesn't matter if they were like positive but mixed and doesn't matter if they were just barely giving it a positive. It's just one or the other. Same way as for Rotten, 59% or lower, it's a rotten film to them based off of their scoring system. And when you understand all of that, it should change the way you understand it because inherently within that, there's a bias towards films that have a broad audience. Movies that appeal to a lot of people as opposed to niche audiences. So to give you an illustration, for me, I enjoy vanilla ice cream because, it, well, it's vanilla and it's good. So you give me a bad bowl of vanilla ice cream, as long as it's frozen, I'm going to like it because it's vanilla. It's a likable product that you've handed me. You can give me the absolute best ice cream filled with a bunch of weird nuts in it, and I'm going to struggle to like it because I don't like nuts in my ice cream. It doesn't matter. It's the best ice cream with nuts in it. But I don't like that. It's a very niche thing for a group of people that love that. And so they'll rate this, and this is the best ice cream on the planet Earth. And a bunch of people that don't like nuts in their ice cream will just say, I mean, it was really good for ice cream with nuts in it, but I can't recommend it because I don't like ice cream with nuts in it. So for one person, it's the best. Other people, it's the worst. Whereas vanilla, it's the worst bowl of ice cream, but it's still a bowl of vanilla ice cream, so it's a positive experience for me. So you have to think about the Rotten Tomato score in that terms of, it doesn't matter how big, how small, it's rated either rating. It's just whether it's fresh or negative. And so things that have a very broad audience tend to have very high tomato meter scores. And so that's where you look at movies from Disney and Pixar and Marvel, and they just across the board all have really high fresh tomato scores because it's all under the Disney umbrella that has mastered very broad commercial filmmaking that appeals to people without... Um, being too cheapened by just being a mass product. They've mastered that formula and they've had that mastered for a long time. And so you even look at like the Marvel movies that people generally say are the bad ones. So you look at like Thor 2, Iron Man 2. Those have fresh scores on Rotten Tomatoes. I just double checked it. They're fresh. Why? Because they create products that are easy to enjoy. Therefore, did most critics enjoy the experience of watching it? Yeah, they liked it. And the only reason that really most of us score them as just terrible, the worst of the Marvel movies, because compared to the other ones, they are, but it's still a, it's a bad bowl of vanilla ice cream. Still enjoyable to eat, just not as good as a great bowl of vanilla ice cream. But when you compare it also to whatever movies us as individuals love in our niche preferences, the specifics we like, when you compare Iron Man 2 to that, it doesn't compare well. But then again, to other people, this niche thing that I really like, you might not really like because it's not inside your wheelhouse. So you have to think about all of that when you understand the tomato score and why they like certain things, why they don't like certain things, and why on earth all these Disney, Pixar, Marvel films are rated so high up. Because it's something that's easy to enjoy, and they make good entertainment that's easy to enjoy for a broad audience. Specifically, you think Pixar movies, they're made for families. They are made to have humor that will engage little kids. So my two-year-old and my four-year-old love Pixar movies. They also have deeper emotional values to them that my two-year-old does not understand at all. She does not understand that Inside Out is about puberty. She does not understand the scene in the movie that's all about the transition from very concrete thinking to abstract thinking. And she just sees funny shapes on the screen, so she laughs, whereas she has no clue, because she's a concrete thinker that cannot possibly understand abstract thinking, that that's what the scene is actually about. Which is interesting to me, because it's such sophisticated humor that somehow is also interesting to my two-year-old. Hence why... Inside Out has an incredibly high rating on the tomato score because they made something that intrigued me as someone that's thinking on a deeper level and put funny pictures on the screen so my two-year-old enjoyed it as well. Next, you need to understand the function of critics. So to get on Rotten Tomatoes, to be able to write for a newspaper, to be able to grow a gigantic following, you have to go see everything and review everything or almost everything. 
And you can even think of the YouTube guys that you probably follow. They see most everything that comes out, even if they don't want to. Whereas you, you only go see movies you want to go see. So there's a movie coming out this weekend called Nine Lives. I'm not going to go see it. No interest in seeing it. Don't want to review it. Don't any of that. Uh, I haven't even seen the trailer. I don't even want to waste two minutes on this thing because it has no interest to me. Looking at its tomato score, I'm probably right because it's at like 5%. Critics don't have that option of saying, ah, I'm not interested. They have to go. So they do go, and then they rate it based off of rate a movie they weren't interested in seeing the way you'd imagine they would. Whereas you, you go see movies you want to go see. And so for like for me, I don't really like any of the Transformers movies. Even the first one, I'm like, yeah, that was mildly enjoyable. I kind of view all of them. It's just kind of noise in front of my face. I'm not bored. I'm not really entertained. It's just there in front of my face, and it's annoying me because it's so bloated. Um, Some of you love Transformers movies. Some people love the first one and don't like the other ones. Critics have not been terribly kind to any of them, but critics have to keep going to go see them. And so they're going to tend to rate them negatively because they don't even want to go see them. Then they see it and it's just as bad as they thought. And so they're going to rate it negatively. Whereas I'm not going to rate it at all. And you want to go see it if you like those movies. And so you're going into it for this product that you know exactly what it is. Because we're on like, what, the fifth one now? So you know what you're getting when you go see it. So then you're like, well, I really love that movie that I wanted to go see that provided exactly what I was expecting from it. The critic didn't want to go see it, but had to go see it anyway. So there's a gigantic gap between our fanboy of Transformers movies and the critics that didn't want to go see it. That's not because critics are wrong. It's not because they're angry old men. It's because to do their job, they have to watch movies that are not likely something that they want to go see. That's the inherent nature of being a critic. You have to review all of it. And this is where the tomatoes meter bias comes out most Clearly, as we talked about before, they are biased towards things that have a broad audience. If someone makes a good product that lots of people will like, it's high on the tomato meter. Pixar movies, Marvel movies, Disney movies. Consistently across the board, that's what you see. And those are also movies that lots of people do like to go see. They do appeal to families and adults. And so there's also a connection pretty well between audience and the critics when it comes to those ones. It's other things where it starts getting much more divisive in where there's movies that critics are inclined to like because they break off from the vanilla mold of blockbuster films and they tend to love those and a lot of times they're more divisive amongst the common viewing audience. And this is why it's so pivotal to not just look at the Rotten Tomatoes score, not just trust the trailers, but find critics that you trust, that have movie taste similar to yours, or that articulate their opinion in a way that you can make sense of it, that it's useful to you personally. So some critics, they just talk about it from a standpoint of technically speaking, how was it directed and the shot composition and the cinematography and how was the editing done and the pacing. If that's not your language, that you reviewer is not useful to you. If they're just common armchair, armchair person that watches movies, love movies, talk about movies the way casual people talk about movies, that you'll probably be able to interpret what they're saying better. So you need to know you and find those reviewers that communicate the way that you listen. Last thing I want to talk about real quick is the movie-going experience. Your movie-going experience can shape how you feel about the movie. So you have to stop and think about critic screenings. Our room's full of critics, and I don't know what it's like everywhere. Here in Austin, where I'm at, it's a row or two full of critics, and then a room full of people that waited in line for hours to get into the screening. So I go to two, three of these every year, go to critic screenings. I saw Star Trek, the 2009 one, like a month before it came out, which was really cool, with the critics in Austin. And um, so you're in a room with critics and then a bunch of people that are serious enough about movies to wait in line and to figure out how to get tickets to go see in advance screenings where they've got a buddy. And so it's a much more refined movie-going experience. It's not a bunch of hooting and hollering, screaming, people giving each other high fives, people talking to each other, because it's really frowned upon in this environment. You start talking during a movie with critics in it, people really don't like you very much. Different experience, I went to go see 
Fast Five at a midnight screening. Literally midnight screening on an XD screen. So, you know, it's not quite IMAX, but huge screen. Great picture, great sound. Huge theater. Packed. And, like, the parking lot looks like we went to the car show. I mean, there's just car, 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 sports car, people revving their engines. So just before we're in the parking lot parking our cars, and we're getting pumped before the movie starts. So my experience watching Fast Five was pumped to the max. So even if the movie was bad, I was going to have an awesome time watching this movie. As opposed to if I watched that exact same movie, which is just, you know, raw entertainment with a group of critics silently. No hooting and hollering, no one like, yeah, no one cheering. Those are two different experiences. And so, like, for example, I went to go see Batman v Superman in that same exact XD theater where I saw uh, Fast Five, packed opening night, and our theater is hooting and hollering during the movie. Wonder Woman comes up, you're like, finally, yeah, just screaming their heads off. Doing crap like that throughout the whole movie. When everything, something cool happened, people are cheering. So the energy, the fun I had in that room made me like the movie more than I actually liked the movie when I rewatched it. When I saw it a second time in the theater with a thinly packed crowd, suddenly my rating dropped a lot. And so you have to factor in some of those factors. And if you go with all your best friends to go see a movie you were all pumped about and you're like, yeah. You're going to like it more than a critic sitting in a room full of critics, taking notes, getting ready to write an article about a movie they didn't want to go see in the first place that's the fourth movie in a series that they haven't liked up to this point in time. Imagine the difference. There's a reason tomato scores are what they are, and the reason your score is what you put it at. Find critics you agree with or that you understand. That's what you need to do. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't suck, but maybe your interpretation of Rotten Tomatoes suck. You need to understand what you're looking at. It really is a very useful tool once you understand what it is. If you like this video, please click that like button and perhaps share it on your Facebook page. And subscribe to this page if you want to hear me rant about more things. Thank you for watching.